Hello and good afternoon, everyone. We're really glad that you are able to join us today for this uh, legislative roundtable with our reps in District 30. Uh, a few things as we uh, begin in terms of housekeeping. Uh, the Chamber had read uh, a number of articles about how we're all exhausted from all the Zoom meetings. And one of the reasons why is looking at all the faces all the time, trying to make eye contact all the time, et cetera. So we are recording with our speakers uh, will be the faces you see, except for the people that are smart enough to get their photos in their um, tagline. Looking at you, Chris Levitt. Um, but let's begin. So I, of course, am Becca. I have the great privilege of being the CEO of the Greater Federal Way Chamber of Commerce. And for the legislative update today, we have joining us Senator Claire Wilson and Representative Jesse Johnson. Representative uh, Mike Pelliciotti will be uh, making an effort to join us later. Uh, as we begin, we uh, would like to offer a few moments for our legislators to give us an introduction and a little update on um, some things they've been working on and what they're looking forward to. And then we're going to get into the questions that have come from our members. So, um, Senator, let's start with you. Claire? So, um, I am really happy to be here. I think this is the first time that I've sat in front of you as Senator and um, as a, a larger group of the chambers. So really pleased to be here today. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the reason why is probably because of uh, this unprecedented time that we're all in right now. Um, I'll say that I know Representative Johnson and Pellicciotti and myself have all been engaged pretty much on a daily basis in uh, finding out and figuring out uh, what's happening, not only at the state level, but also at the federal level as we kind of move through not only the pandemic stage, but now thinking forward around what recovery looks like. And we've had lots of things happening and lots of changes that have been going down. Um, I guess the most important thing is um, there's been lots of um, issues I know that individuals have dealt with around unemployment insurance and around access to small business association and the commerce. Um, and those things are, I think, just the sheer, the sheer numbers. Um, and you've probably seen in the papers unprecedented numbers of individuals applying, but also unable to really make their way through. But I think as the days move forward, things are getting a little bit better, if you will. Um, but there has been a lot of work on a bicameral group that's happened both in the House and the Senate, um, working with the governor and now community leadership groups um, working to think about recovery. Um, there's some revenue updates that you may be interested. We could talk a little bit about and some budget updates as far as um, forecasting. Um, myself um, in the Senate spending a lot of time thinking about recovery. And in particular, we're kind of looking at it from a systems approach. And so thinking about um, supporting people, supporting businesses and nonprofits, uh, stimulus and revenue stability and investing in our economy and supporting trade. So kind of thinking about things outside our traditional committee work, but again, how we think cross system and cross sector. So uh, I'm in the supporting people group. So my big area of emphasis is going to be um, childcare. And I say that because in order for us to recover, um, rather regardless of whether you're a small business or a large business, uh, the employees that you have um, need to know their kids are going to be cared for safely. And we've had a large number um, closed during this time. So um, I think I'll stop there. But I just, just know that every single day it's thinking about the bigger picture and what it means not only for federal way, but for the larger community in the state. Thank you very much, Senator, for um, your work. Representative Johnson. Uh, good evening, everyone, or good afternoon. Uh, I just want to thank Becca for setting this up. I know it was just an idea last week, and we planted that seed and, and quickly got it to come to fruition. So thank you, Becca, for coordinating with our offices. Uh, I just want to say hello, everyone. It's good to see your virtual faces and voices uh, during this time. I know it's a very challenging time, and it's disruption of life for everyone. And I just want to say, uh, as Senator Wilson mentioned, we are regularly on calls, almost repetitively on calls. Uh, and it's been very interesting to hear the different perspectives and opinions around reopening, non-reopening, um, safety, healthcare, education, uh, just so many ideas and perspectives out there. 
and I continue to just be a listener and also to make sure that I'm collaborating with my colleagues. And I think Senator Wilson and Representative Pelciotti have done a great job as well, uh, just staying um, ears to you know what's happening in Olympia in our community. Uh, just very quickly, I wanted to mention some of the things that we're working on. We're working on everything from, uh, as Senator Wilson mentioned, child care, education, food security, which our community has done a really good job in our in the 30th, uh, coming together to to help find food and and make sure that our folks are fed in our community, housing, personal safety, and as we're looking at uh, reopening our economy and trying to boost our economy in phases, we also want to do so without compromising the health of our community. And I think that it's going to take a lot of uh, people coming together to, to think about how this is going to play out. I know the governor has three advisory groups that have started in the last week around education, health, and, and economic resiliency. And so uh, just know that rest assured your legislators are working to make sure that we're bringing the, the voice of our district uh, to those conversations. And I look forward to questions. Thank you very much, uh, Representative Johnson. Uh, and when uh, uh, Representative Pelichotti is um, able to join us, we'll hear from him as well. So we had a number of questions. There's quite a few. Some we've shared, some that were even coming in today. Let's just start with um, real easy. Uh, we heard that uh, there is, regarding the lawsuit that's been filed against the governor's plan, what do you think the impact of that will be pro and con? Uh, Senator Wilson. So I was on a call with our caucus today and right now from what I know that uh, it was not initiated by leadership, it was initiated by members um, of the minority party. So um, right now I think the, the main interest is, is thinking about uh, coming back in in the right way and uh, doing it where we're not compromising the health and the well-being of individuals and moving uh, the lever too quickly. It's more of a dimmer switch than it is an on off switch. Um, but I do think that you'll see and you have seen there's a movement as far as tearing in as far as how things are being brought in and on the call today. Um, I heard that you'll probably hear this afternoon or tomorrow uh, the plans in place for bringing more folks in on the phase one. So I think, um, you know, the most important thing is they're using uh, the construction phase in, if you will, as the model for how they're bringing other um, industry and other professions in. And so once they have those kinds of plans in place, those kinds of things will be um, will be happening. Jessica? Thank you. Um, anything? Yeah. yeah, I'll quickly just add to that. I, I think uh, one of the questions that, that I hope is is being asked as, as that lawsuit is going through is, uh, you know, first and foremost, safety. As we're continuing to contain the spread of COVID-19, how are we also um, looking at how reopening is gonna impact that? And then also asking ourselves, how comfortable are workers themselves going back, um, going back to work? And, you know, what is the consumption behavior pre-COVID-19? Is that gonna continue post as we go into this phasing? And so we need to look at, um, from all different levels, we need to look at consumers, the, the health of our, of our workers and our employees, and then also all, uh, obviously the health of our economy too. But there's just a lot to balance there. And I think the more questions we ask um, to ourselves as policymakers and community, the better we can get the answers. Yeah. I, I think there's also an issue of where there has been outbreaks and where there hasn't. And unfortunately, King County is one of those places where we won't see necessarily um, the same things happening perhaps as counties that can open um, once they have a plan in place um, because they haven't had cases of COVID and they've got the ability in case there is an outbreak to, to stop and, and also care for the medical needs of individuals. So, um, you know, I think we're seeing things slowly open up and slowly come back, um, but it, you know, it's going to be a slow go. Um, and those three weeks between phases, two weeks are done for the opening and to make sure there's no outbreak. There's an additional week to get the data to make sure that the data is collected, says there's no new outbreak before the next phase opens up, which is why the three weeks are in between. Thank you very much. Um, we had a number of questions about um, essential workers. Um, so 
try to uh, bundle those together. Uh, the first of which was who who was choosing which jobs were essential, and then the second one, which is a broader question. I mean, are we at the point where we should discuss what an essential worker is, so that there's an agreed definition across um, across the state, not um, just individually? Do you want to take a stab at that one, uh, Jesse, first, or Representative Johnson first? Absolutely. It looks like Rep. Pelicciotti uh, just joined us there on Derek's uh, uh, audio and, and video there. So uh, welcome, Mike. Uh, so just to answer that question briefly, I know that the essential job list was actually based on standards that the federal government and uh, had put together in California's definition of essential critical infrastructure workers. So um, it's based off that federal standard. And so I know there's been a lot of questions of what is deemed essential, um, but I think you know, uh, it definitely can be can be asked. I definitely think that there's uh, a lot of people that feel like construction should have been considered essential from the beginning, or you know, obviously uh, different professions should be or should not be. But I think based on that uh, original federal um, definition of it, uh, that's what we operated from. And I think that right now we're looking at um, the Washington Small Business Development Center and is working mm -hmm. with Olympia around um, as we reopen in phase two and three in the summertime, um, hopefully, um, what will the uh, definitions look like for those phases? And I think the governor laid out a plan for that in his last, mm -hmm. um, his last press conference. Yeah, I think the, the other thing was we have to look at what was versus what is now, because even then, even now things have changed. And initially it wasn't so much the profession as it was um, the conversation around when an individual goes out to work, um, all the contact spots that they would have on their way. So for example, if you were um, the guy doing gutters or someone doing gutters, you would stop perhaps to get gas and then you might get a latte and then you'd go to your gutters and then you might get a latte. So every time you stop to do something was a, a point of potential infection and so Part of it was thinking about that um, more so than it was the actual profession. So, because um, people were thinking, if I work by myself, why is it that I can't go out and do my work? So initially, um, when I had had conversations with public health, that um, became really a, an interesting conversation because it, it's a different lens to look through. Now, we really have to say, um, and I think do some redefining and also um, perhaps expanding the definition um, of what essential worker is, all the while um, keeping our eyes on safety and keeping our eyes on potential wave two, which is what we don't want to have happen in our state. Thank you. So um, Representative Pellicciotti, um, I'm going to give you an opportunity to answer this question and then go to your short hello and intro. Um, uh, the, but first, the essential worker and the definition. Thoughts? Well, sure. First of all, hi, Dr. Ed. I'm sorry for the earlier technical uh, difficulties. It's good to uh, to join you and, and have life. you from the chamber. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Uh, on, on the call. Um, you, you know, I guess, uh, you know, I, I missed, when I came on, I didn't catch the original uh, part of the question and what, obviously, some of the questions are what it means to be an essential worker. But one of the things that yeah. I think is um, most important and what would be most helpful as a part of this call is um, really hearing from from members here in the chamber, uh, you know, as to local businesses that we can uh, communicate to the governor's office that that might not uh, fully align within the current phased uh, reopening that's been laid out. And so, obviously, as as, as I'm sure you've been discussing before I uh, joined on this call, the uh, you know the phased in approach is identifying you know certain industries and in different ways in which. Um, businesses can reopen. If there are unique um, businesses here in the 30th district or specifically uh, members here in the federal way chamber um, that, that find that they uh, can, can open or do business in a way um, as an industry, specifically as an industry, that is not um, uh, currently being recognized in the phased in approach that, you know, I want to make sure that we're communicating that um, you know, to the governor's office so that any decisions that, that continually are being made are, are, are fully well informed. Um, thank you for that. That brings us to uh, the mind of the chat. Uh, the chat is on the side. So if you have those kind of questions, if you can let us know so that we can 
uh, forward that in and then I can't find the raise your hand section um, for unmuting and as we move forward. But um, let me ask this question. We, uh, we know that many establishments will need advice and technical assistance to ensure their employees are able to work safely um, and their customers are safe as well. How can the state work to prepare small businesses for the emerging new realities of operation? Who wants to go first, uh, Senator? Well, yeah. Or Mike? Mike, go for it. No, I'm sorry. Go, go ahead, Senator. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, all, all I was going to say is, you know, one of the, the big investments uh, that we made on the last day of, of session, seeing uh, the, the COVID crisis uh, coming upon us and recognizing it was our last day of session is uh, we were able to invest about $200 million, uh, million dollars, um, from the budget stabilization account uh, to, uh, to, to deal essentially with this crisis. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the big investments that have, has come out of that um, is in uh, PPE uh, being purchased by the state. I, the last figure I saw, and it was a couple weeks ago, was uh, that the governor's office and the Department of Health was using these resources um, in, in, in part, obviously, to purchase about 65, 65 million uh, N95 masks. And you know, my, my expectation is that the use of this PPE, which would normally be provided by the federal government, um, uh, which of course is, is not available to, to states now around the country, is you know, we've relied on, on our resources to, to try to uh, find some of this protective equipment so that uh, businesses are gonna be able to, to, to reopen in a way that's, that's safe um, for, for both customers and, and obviously for, for the workers. And, and owners of those businesses as well. So I, 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 would, I would highlight that first. I, I don't know the, the latest from the Department of Health in terms of their plans and, and in which part, how much of that is going obviously first to first responders and medical providers. But, but I think the ultimate uh, hope is, is that um, we'll continue to invest in the, the protective equipment that, that really is what's gonna be necessary um, for us to, to avoid the impacts that, that I think other states are gonna see as a second wave comes in and it, you know it, it allows allows for us to to do um you know to to, to operate in, in, a, in a safe manner thank you um senator anything to add um oh there's so much no i'm let me just yeah not right now i mean there's just so much um rep johnson do you okay. have anything sure um just kind of going off of what Mike said, I think just like how can we continue to create a close alignment between the Department of Health and our business community? I think as construction reopened, um, I think it was a great model and we had worker and employer groups that negotiated safe practices and what those guidelines would look like and how do they, they could follow them. And they had to be modified and then remodified and then approved. All that happened before um, it was allowed to reopen. And so I think the same is going to have to happen in the different phases um, so that we have good cooperation and communication. And also, I think consumer confidence follows public health approval. So when the Department of Health says this is opening in a way that's not going to compromise community health, I think consumers feel more confident going out into the community to um, shop at our businesses and so I th or, or, you know, take part in business. So I think it's important that that alignment is there. You know, and just following up with what Representative Johnson was saying, I think that that is the critical component of what I think Washington State's trying to do that other states aren't, aren't being quite so thoughtful about is, um, you know, businesses opening up, or it's only so good as, as the customers show up. And we need to make sure that, that the customers uh, feel safe uh, going out and, and doing business and uh, putting, putting those, those mechanisms in place so that that, that assurance is, is there um, across all industries where we can, uh, where we can safely do that. I think is, is really gonna be the, 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 the most thoughtful way that we, we can approach this that, that really addresses kind of the longer term challenge and, and realizes that what we don't want is the second wave or a second wave that then discourages people from uh, shopping out locally at all. And um, you know, doing it in a way again that, that allows for a smoother transition and reopening the economy. And I think that goes for employees need to feel safe too and feel like um, they're being protected as um, essential workers and as we bring folks back in again, uh, concerns about children, concerns about family um, and their situations have changed. And I think support might look a little um, different or we may need more support for more individuals. And I think 
um, the smaller the business, the more difficult it is for an employer to do that. And, and so it's really going to be a collective uh, piece of work together. And I know that Rep. Johnson and um, Beck and I have been having some conversations because it's really critically important. And, you know, the city of Federal Way, as well as our um, surrounding area, needs to, to come together to figure out what that is all going to look like. And the other thing I'll say is there are just, um, you know, there are really quite a few uh, resources available. And the problem, I think, is the sense of frustration and urgency of wanting to access and the inability for people to get the info they need and, and what they see as a timely fashion has been really a struggle. I've heard from a lot of small business owners um, who've not been able to get through or have not heard back on things they've sent in. So again, I think I, I said this to um, a group of constituents and I would say that to business owners, I think Mike, you said the same thing. Um, you know, if there are things that you've um, applied for or having a struggle getting information around or hearing back from, um, you know, please do reach out because that is something that from our offices we can um, do a little bit of sleuthing and finding out if it's uh, just the system or whether there's something that's keeping um, things from moving forward. So, um, and I also want to make sure, Becca, that you know, we've given um, and that folks have access to all of the resource and the links that are available um, from both the state, but also the federal small business, the PPP. There's some other, um, you know, um, other, there's just lists of them. And there's so many acronyms, it's hard to describe. And again, um, at least it's a resource. And for some, it may be what you already know, but there may be some new ones for folks, um, given the nature of what's happening. We can pass yes, those and on thank to you. you. Um, the, if you don't know, we do try to keep those updated on our website. It's Fedway Chamber slash coronavirus. Um, when we get anything even related, like you say, uh, FEMA, national, state, um, also county, and of course our uh, community partners. Is um, and I'm 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 trying to see if the mayor is still here, Mayor Jim Farrell. I know that uh, Council President Susan Honda is here as is council person Linda Coachmar. So here's a question that might be a twofold for our senators and um, our city officials. And it involves organized youth sports. Um, they're looking for some clarity on phase three opportunities for youth sports to be able to continue. And then there's a follow up for our city uh, partners. So I'm giving you a heads up there, Larray, for the unmute. But let's um, let's start with uh, our uh, representative uh, Johnson on that one. Phase three opportunities, youth sports to continue. Well, thank you. And I know this question came in. Um, actually, I had a good conversation uh, with uh, Gary Haven of the Little League last week, and then I know Scott Henderson's on the line now. Uh, there is a form right now, um, and I, we can provide it in the link where if you're an organization or a nonprofit community-based organization, you can apply on this form or a business for that matter, and basically say, um, submit the form and say what you do, what you provide, and there's a number of safety guidelines and measures that you would have to be able to meet and explain how you would meet that for it to take place. But uh, the Department of Labor and Industries is overseeing um, some of this, and so if you submit this form and get it in on time, there may be a way where um, if it's summer league, baseball or fall league, uh, football or whatever, there's a way that you, this can be provided in a safe way. But it's definitely not going to happen, I think, for at least the next couple months, which is why this, this form is getting out early so that um, I think the, the state level can get a sense for <clears throat> what is happening and, and how we can enact this. And it's also going to take the city as, in partnership as well to be able to have rentals for fields and all that. So I know that's a big undertaking, but there is a form to be able to do that. And I can provide that in our, in our chat. Yeah. I, uh, from, mm -hmm. oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, Jim Farrell here uh, with the city. So uh, what I would say is that we have not heard anything, but we could certainly be a uh, conduit uh, with the uh, Department of, you know, with the uh, King County Department of Health, the State Department of Health, um, to be able to find that information out. But, you know, we just, as you know, made the decision to cancel the 4th of July uh, Red, White, Blues Festival and the um, uh, Flavor of Federal Way. So, um, you know, we would certainly, uh, we don't have any um, uh, updated information in regard to those youth sports. 
Okay, thank you. I have hit a button and I've lost everybody. Um, who haven't we heard from legislatively? So what I, I will just add to what Jesse said. What I do know is that, you know, as uh, guidance comes in um, from the phased in professions, one doesn't have to ask for permission as long as you meet the guidance of, you know, the, uh, the distancing and all the other things they're asking about. But this would be one of those special situations where you would have to ask for that and have a plan in place. But I want to really be cautious around thinking when I think about sports, I think a group of children, groups of kids coming together. And uh, we have school that hasn't come back in. There's not going to come back in until potentially in the fall. And even then it may look very, very different. So I would be really cautious about thinking that we may um, have the ability to bring kids back together in a sporting venue um, before we would bring them back in other ways. Um, and that just is from thinking through, I don't know that unless there's particular sports where we can make sure that distancing occurs. But, um, you know, I would just wanna make sure as uh, Rep Johnson said that you, there was a very clear plan in place, but, um, groups of kids together um, in more than small groups initially for quite a while, I think it's gonna be, um, it's gonna be a tough one. So um, not saying no, but that's, that's a tough one. From what I, everything I hear from public health and everything else, uh, that'll be one of the last things as groups of people coming together. Right. Uh, 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 oh, I, I, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say anything to add. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, it, it's, uh, you know, obviously not, not all sports are, are the same. I mean, it's right, in the sense right. that in terms of social mm -hmm. distancing, and I think ultimately it's, those are going to be calls made up to uh, state public health officials. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly something like, like tennis, golf, or even baseball is different than uh, a sport like soccer right. or football right. in terms of, of contact. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, you know, obviously, you know, we all want to, you know, see things open as soon as they safely can. I mean, one of the things that that happened this last session, despite the governor uh, having to cut a little over uh, more than a little more than $400 million uh, in, in final expenses, um, or I should say $400 million from the final budget, um, we were able to specifically shield the, um, uh, the, the investments that, that, that we put forward as a legislative delegation, including the expansion of, of Little League fields here in Federal Way, uh, and uh, in, in addition to other developments, but also the Redondo Pier and beginning the construction efforts there. And so, um, you, you know, a lot of that type of stimulus local here specifically to the, to the district, I think is gonna be important, not just from a economic development standpoint, but, but ultimately uh, as soon as health, uh, health officials give, give, the, give the green light to, to be able to open up some of those, those sporting opportunities as well. And, and outdoor okay, thank and, you very and, much. and environmental yeah. opportunities. Uh, and thank you. And I see that Representative Johnson have uh, put a link there uh, to help for those of you who need some more information on that. Um, Scott Henderson, I believe you want to um, share some input regarding uh, child care. Yeah. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Um, I, I worked, um, you, this actually uh, is not related directly to, to Little League business, but I uh, uh, I definitely appreciate uh, Senator Wilson's emphasis on, on child care. And uh, although my children are adults now, uh, I had some input that I thought would be, would be helpful. Uh, having worked in the uh, tech industry for many, many years, I think that, um, I think that everyone would, uh, would agree that uh, a technology from being a child of the 70s may have actually saved potentially millions of lives. The ability to have these Zoom meetings to, to be able to uh, provide the technologies uh, so that companies can uh, for those uh, types of workers who can work from home to be able to, to have them continue to, to work and provide services. I think that this is incredibly significant in that uh, uh, as we move uh, out of this event, things will be changed forever. They're, they're not going to go back to the way that they were before mm -hmm. and going to be relying more and more on technology. Uh, and, and one of the things that, that came to mind uh, that can help bolster this is a robust child care a type of environment. I think somebody said something about what do you do for, for workers who don't want to go back to work? Well, if you can facilitate more easily uh, the ability to work from home for those that can, uh, then that's going to, I think, uh, pave the way forward to um, reduce number of interactions and reduce number of, uh, of incidences of, of, um, of contraction of this disease. 
things are never going to be the same. I think we realize that. Uh, it, these are changing and evolving faster than we've ever seen them before. Uh, my daughter happens to work for an online nanny service. Uh, my loving nanny, there's Annie's nannies. There's a bunch of different uh, types of uh, childcare services that aren't traditional in-home 12 dozen, 24 to one type scenarios mm -hmm. uh, that, that uh, we can support from a commerce standpoint allow for a robust reopening where people stay in place. They don't normally go, they don't necessarily have to go back to work. The companies are going to continue to support these work from home strategies because they do reduce, reduce interaction. So anything we can do to try to bolster uh, the, this, this industry that will be you know, blowing up in an online many services where uh, rather than it be, um, you know, where you drop a kid off to traditional daycare, but the nannies come to you, uh, the problems would be that those are independent contractors, that those folks are not going to have traditional health care services, that they're, they're going to need to have more robust testing, and, and, but people are going to be more comfortable with uh, closer to a one-on-one -on -one type of uh, relationship for child care. They're going to need child care uh, folks who can come into their home and have this, the, the, the reasonable security that they're, they're not going to be contracting the disease that way. Um, and, and it's something I wanted to, to mention to you, Senator Wilson, because mm -hmm. I do believe that by supporting people with, uh, with robust child care, that uh, you will allow them to stay in place and not have to return to the workplace as we move forward. Uh, and I think this could be a huge benefit to, to commerce in our yeah. Yeah. And, and I think it's an and both. Yeah, I think it's an and both situation. I appreciate that because um, there are many in the tech industry and in others where working at home um, is something that's um, it's kind of a long time coming. And finally, people have seen that yeah, people can be productive and be at home. Um, on the same respect, we have a lot of service industry, a lot of retail. We have a lot of industry in our community that does not lend itself to um, working from home, as well as thinking about. Um, the issue of the cost and and um, while um, it would be awesome to have individuals have one-on-one -on -one care for kids um, there are many in our communities that are not going to be able to afford that so it's an and both I think we have to look at all kinds of, of types of service and support for families um, that meet many people's needs and some of those would be a nanny some of them are going to be family, friends, and neighbors. Some of them are going to be a family child care home. Some are going to be a center. Um, I do know we have an expanding need right now for school age care because our children are not in school, which has been the typical babysitter, if you will, for six to eight hours a day while children are learning. Um, we are now in a place where families will be going back, adults will be going back to work, and kids until they go back to school will either be at home or on some kind of modified schedule. So I really appreciate that, Scott, and we can continue to, to work together on that. I also know some businesses like um, Starbucks use that service for sick care. So if they have an employee who um, has a sick child and needs uh, care and doesn't have it, that that's part of a, um, a benefit that's available that some businesses, larger businesses have. Um, so worthy of a conversation, and I appreciate the information. Representative Johnson, anything to share? No, I think Senator Wilson covered it. Yeah. Uh, Representative Pelchetti? Uh, no, I, I was uh, always defer to Senator Wilson. No, okay. on this. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm being good. I'm asking. Um, so we have, here's a quick question, then we'll, we'll talk a little bit legislatively. But do you guys um, happen... Do any of our uh, delegation, do we know yet what, how much money from the governor's uh, grant uh, pool that he had put out, how much of that came into federal way? Do we know that yet? He had that special uh, $10 million grant for all across uh, Washington. And so one of the questions that w that is coming to the chamber is how much of that money came to federal way? I expect we don't have those figures yet, but if, if you guys, somebody could track them and let us know, we'll, we'll be able to share that. Yeah. Okay, the second one, um, uh, again, two, twofold, and it goes about um, the possible special session was, do we have, uh, do, you, do you know what the Speaker of the House is planning, and are there any legislative changes that you would be looking at um, in a special session that might help um, businesses retain their employees? Who 
would like to start on that one? Representative well, Johnson, just, you're shaking your mic. Oh, I, I was just going to say generally, I mean, I, I think there's still a lot up in the air in terms of uh, when a special session is likely to be called. I think most of the issues we're going to be uh, focused on related to the special session, it, it's mostly going to be dealing with kind of uh, budget related impacts once we get the, uh, uh, the next uh, economic forecast. And I think that um, you know, I, I don't anticipate a particularly long special session. Um, my guess is it will be in the next couple months, if, if not within the next month. Um, and, and, you know, in, in those situations, obviously, uh, constitutionally, it's something that the governor uh, generally calls. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think a lot of the focus is going to be on doing that, which is, is, is specifically necessary um, on a budgetary standpoint. But obviously, everything we do is going to be with the outlook of how it can best uh, address the, the those specific economic needs that we have here locally. Representative Johnson. Yeah, I think I think Representative Palciotti covered it uh, as in terms of uh, when a special session could be. We've heard we'll probably have one more than likely. I, I anticipate we would need one, but um, as of right now, it would have to be from the governor's desk. Uh, I do know uh, moving into um, what that could look like. There is an economic resiliency task force that the governor has put together with legislators and uh, business leaders across the state. And I've kind of been checking in with them and they're looking at a lot of different things, everything from delayed or deferred uh, taxes, tax payments till 2021 for small businesses. Um, also looking at uh, grant programs for small businesses working directly with their chamber. Um, so that could be something, although we do have a huge hurdle with the budget um, when we do get to a session. And also kind of on a, on a different note, I know that legislators are working around a letter to send to um, our federal de delegation as well uh, around a paycheck guarantee program where basically small businesses um, would have 100% of their payroll uh, expenses covered for three months from the federal government. And so I know that letter is, is circulating right now and trying to get support as well. So that's, that's kind of what I know for right now, but I know we can't really do too much on the state end until we get to a special session. Can I just, uh, Senator, before uh, your comments, I just, uh, knowing that that discussion is taking place, um, one of the issues that we had in federal way that, uh, and across the country was the difference between a C3 and a C6. None of the grant uh, programs or the, pay, uh, the PPP programs included C6s. Um, and I know that we are lobbying and to get them included as well. But as you have that conversation to keep in mind that C6 and C3 are both nonprofits and they both need that kind of support. Didn't want to miss my chance there. Senator Wilson. Well, I'll take that with me. As a matter of fact, I just wrote it down on my uh, recovery page for that uh, nonprofit small business group because I think it's an important thing to, to think yeah. about. And our nonprofits specifically have had a very difficult time thinking about um, their inability right now to fundraise and to really get the dollars they normally do to provide service for our families and have spent money they don't even have, just like the school district has, that's yet to be um, you know, reimbursed, if, if it ever will, um, from FEMA or the other dollars. Um, I did want to say I was on a call just this morning where we did get a budget update um, from the Senate caucus, and I um, can share, you know, they're very, very, um, uh, you know, not, not finalized numbers, but it gives you an idea of kind of as we talk about the potential of a special session, what um, we're looking at as far as um, budget, at least this is the Senate perspective. But um, April 30th, they have, you know, they, it's, it's really the a budget update. That's when the governor's, all the vetoes and such that he has done um, since the session ended kind of come through and they looked at that and then the Revenue Forecast Council kind of overlaid their their initial draft, if you will, of um, their forecast on top of that. And um, what uh, to date what they're saying is that there's a $3.8 um, billion dollar loss of revenue. Uh, 2.8 um, is we have that sitting in the fund balance and so there's going to need to be about a $900 million either reduction or uh, revenue in whatever, if we're doing a special session, we've got some dollars we need to um, 
think about figuring out where that's going to come from. And then that will continue as we move into, you know, the next session as well. We're going to have to think about um, recovery. Um, but it was also interesting. They talked a little bit about revenue numbers. Um, and this was through the first phase of COVID. Um, and that food and beverage was up uh, 25%. Um, and obviously many more people eating at home and buying groceries and such, um, and the closure of restaurants, um, that this was the highest ever sales for marijuana, um, and particularly among seniors, interestingly enough, and that there was a 6% drop in alcohol sales. And the thinking initially was that would have increased, but perhaps there's fewer people out to drink, so the drinking is being done at home and there may be less. But um, it was kind of an interesting thing um, as we look at revenue and we look at kind of where um, dollars have been spent, which also is a concern coming back into recovery, literally and figuratively, um, individuals who perhaps, you know, um, are at home and have been at home may also need some additional um, mental health and behavioral health and uh, health services and supports when they come back. So um, those were just um, from numbers this morning. So thought I'd share. Thank you very much. Um, Representative Pellet, I lost where I was in um, the, the series. Do you have anything to add to that one or did you speak on this one already? No, I think it's a kind of what, you know, I appreciate yeah. the update, updated numbers that Senator Wilson has provided. She has really been a been doing doing a lot for our delegation and being on on pretty much every every call that there is to to be had and, and keeping us uh, making sure we're, we have the most updated information as we as the three of us communicate on these issues. Um, you know you know what I will say is obviously we're we're getting hit you know from both ends. I mean we're we're getting hit on the revenue side um, in terms of uh, revenue that would have been anticipated that won't be coming in and then uh, you know, again speaking from a state budget standpoint this is and then also on the expense side as you have you know increased costs for unemployment uh, and, and other things. And it's, um, uh, you know, we, we have an obligation to make that balance. And so, uh, you know, that will be, you know, one of the things that, that, that we'll be working on. But I, I think, you know, the, the main focus time and time again is if there are kind of unique needs that we have here that we can make yeah. sure um, are being communicated mm -hmm. that that's, I think that the focus we have, because needless to say, you know, lots of folks are around, are around this issue right now, um, you know, from a larger standpoint. And uh, we, we just want to make sure that, that we're being heard on those things that are unique here uh, within the federal way chamber and obviously unique to the 30th legislative district. Yes, um, thank you very much. We had another question. Um, which, uh, which underserved segments of the business community are you most worried about and why uh, within our district? Hmm. Then uh, let's go. Representative Johnson. Oh, that's a great question. I mean, I, first and foremost, I think, um, like Mike said, like, how can we identify the unique uh, businesses within our community? I think just from um, my knowledge of the community, I know we have a lot of um, businesses where there are um, women and minority owned businesses uh, that typically don't have the relationships with banks and credit unions to access some of these um, loans and grants opportunities. So I know that we're going to have to do more to help those businesses. And we have, to, we have to do things a little bit differently, I think, than in the past. And we can't just continue to do things better, but do them differently. And I think um, those businesses are ones that are disadvantaged historically and have not been uh, provided support, uh, especially in times of need. So I'd love to look at that. I also think uh, we have a really uh, unique market in the 30th when it comes to med, uh, med tech and maritime and some of these other industries. Uh, that, uh, you know, typically aren't, aren't talked about. I also think that the art spaces um, is, is, is an interesting um, business where we haven't been able to um, support in the past. So I think going into not just the special session, but next year's session, there's a lot of opportunities to engage with some of those unique uh, business sectors that we definitely haven't had an opportunity in the past. And then obviously the trades is, is going to be really important because uh, they are keeping our uh, community going in terms of building and so making sure that uh, private residential construction, landscaping, um, you know, auto, um, everything like that, some of those trade industries is being supported. Thank you. Senator? 
I'm, um, you know, I've talked a lot to owner operators, small businesses where they've got, you know, few employees, oftentimes family owned business, um, a lot of conversation and a lot of concern with um, obviously food service restaurants in our area, as well as um, hair and nail salons. Um, we have a lot of um, diversity in our communities. We have, as uh, Rep. Johnson said, a lot of uh, women-owned and um, community of color uh, businesses who um, aren't even more negatively impacted. We've seen the inequities um, exacerbated throughout this. And so um, you're not only having opportunity to think about what new business might look like, but how it is that we bring business back in and help them sustain themselves is really um, important to me. And we've continued to talk about that. And it's not something that has been an, um, an area of focus for me, but it is an area that will continue to be something that will be as we move forward. Um, and again, um, if I think of the childcare uh, profession, that is again, women owned and uh, many women of color. And so um, really, really important that we are supporting um, our small businesses here. So um, that's kind of what I think about. I also know that uh, we have individuals that are getting unemployment and perhaps maybe getting more money right now than they um, uh, were making perhaps with the dollars from um, the Fed, the extra dollars from the federal government. And I know there's concern that um, employers have about what if employees don't come back to work because they're making more money on unemployment. And I think, you know, those are the conversations we need to continue to have and, and uh, help people understand kind of the what, the why, and, and how we move forward. But I know that's something um, that I've had conversations with folks around. Thank you. Um, Representative Pelicciotti. Well, thank you. I mean, you know, Scott had mentioned earlier on his que question and comment about uh, some of the market corrections that, uh, that, that may be occurring, you know, through this. And I, I think that, you know, the focus that we have is, uh, you know, first and foremost, um, you know, any, any impact that's happening, especially to those small businesses that are locally owned um, and that, that um, have employees who, who uh, you know, work here within the 30th legislative district. We wanna be doing all we can uh, to address those impacts. But, but, you know, in large part, a lot of this is gonna be through the regular conversations we've been having uh, with, with you, with the chamber, and obviously, you know, today, but, but you know, can, as we go on, to, to look to you for, for those things that are kind of uniquely impactful. Mm -hmm. Um, especially among small businesses here, here in the 30th. And so I, I think that that's going to be continue the focus in, in which we can have direct impact. Again, like I said, I mean, you know, needless to say, it's, this is not something that's just, just affecting our region, but it's affecting the state, the nation, and the world. And so it, it, I, I just want to make sure that as, as, as things, you know, undergo some, some, you know, some change that, that, that we're being thoughtful and, and making sure that, that it's not, that, that it's not negatively impacting our, our region in any way, disproportionately to the impacts that other areas in the state are seeing. Yes, and um, I just wanna add as we go into the um, next question, uh, we do a monthly snapshot where um, since this started, we've just asked um, the trending questions, what, what is most important um, concern? The, everyone has the same concerns, they're all of them, but we're asking people to choose the top one so that as we go through this, we'll be able to chart it. And I will tell you from April to May, there has been no change. It remains the loss of customers and business as the number one concern. The number two concern is um, health. The health concerns remain, remain high. And um, I can't remember what the third one is, but I'll look at my chart, we have it posted. But those are the top two, and those are the twin things that we hear from our small business no matter what industry that it is in, when they talk about recovery retention. Um, I understand that also um, uh, we have Lake Haven Commissioner uh, Ron Nowicki with us uh, with a question. Did you unmute me? Yes. Um, oh, wonderful. Apparently you had, okay, good. <laughs> You're on. I'm on, and it's the only time that there's noise here. I apologize for that. Um, as a, there we go. As one of those businesses that's deemed essential, we're also, we're doing two things and I wanted to 
I get say get the legislators to aware of, aware of this, and hopefully Mayor uh, Farrell will be able to comment on it too. We're told we're essential, we have to do things, but under our public meetings law and under the the governor's proclamation, he says we can't do anything in our meetings other than what's COVID related, regular and usual COVID related. And so anything on projects, stuff like that is outside of what we can have in our meeting. So I wanna know if that's also with Jim Farrell's area and you know with the city and um, at least make our legislative group aware of that. Uh, uh, Mayor Farrell? So, uh, no, the, uh, that, actually, Ron, that's not correct. Uh, you can do, you can discuss things that are non-COVID related, uh, but they should be in the normal course of business. That I think what they, the uh, discretion that the state has, has provided is that you shouldn't be doing, um, you know, major projects or things beyond, um, you know, the normal course of business. But there is no prohibition about doing things non-COVID related. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you, Mayor. So we, act, yeah, um, we just had a we just had a three-hour long city council meeting um, on Tuesday, and, and we handled quite a number of things, but they, it went beyond that. They they did have a. Uh, a Emergency proclamation the governor did around, I know, uh, school boards and I believe city councils around their ability to vote, correct, Mayor Farrell? And, and I'm wondering whether this is um, one of those things that um, I would imagine Lake Haven as an elected board would be under the same. I'm not sure, though. We could check it out. But I would, you know, I, I know there's been an extension of that proclamation and some change. So school boards are able to have their school board meetings and take votes uh, through a Zoom meeting um, like this. So I, I'm, I don't know. Okay, that's yeah, it's a good, good question. Yeah. That was Go the ahead. question was, are we allowed to do things beyond that? And Jim is within the city, Mayor Farrell is, is doing some other things. And oh, we yeah. have been instructed that other than the votes that we do for normal things, which is simply pay our bill, bills and then uh, COVID related, no, you can't do those things. Hmm. Well, check it out. I'll check yep. it out. We could ask. Yeah. I mean, I, that's unusual. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Dan Eisenman, uh, we had a question from you earlier about um, employees refusing to return to work. Um, do you want to ask that? Can we unmute Dan? Um, the, the question that you, I'm sorry, did, I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but you had put a question in the, um, the, the chat earlier. Are there any protections being considered for employees who are refusing to return to work and are able to prove their employer is non-compliant with the reopening of health and safety requirements? Yeah, thank you. Cause I've, I've had relayed to me, um, uh, two different situations where um, the the person the, the business reopened uh, and the employee returned to work with the assurances that the the proper measures would be taken from you know taking temperatures at the door social distancing um, proper protections and what they found when they came in was a disregard for all of those things um, and uh, I mean literally all, all right down the line. Um, and it was, we've got bigger things to worry about. And, and I thought, yes, in fact, you do. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I was wondering what, because what the employee was told is, is when she expressed to a manager in one case that she had a concern about this, the manager said, you can choose to not return to work. Um, however, that will be seen as a, you know, a refusal to return to work and, and could be grounds for termination. And I thought, you know, I wonder how many other, because when it came up a second time, a uh, very similar uh, situation, uh, I, I began to wonder if this is something that, that uh, employees are going to run into um, and if employers are also going to be saying, well, how do we handle a situation where an employee feels unsafe? What are they seeing? We're not seeing, et cetera. So 
I, I don't want to go down a rabbit trail, but I just wanted to ask the question is, are there protections for these individuals who, uh, you know, can in fact prove that their employer is non-compliant with the safety uh, requirements placed by the state? I could take that one. So I know that, um, thanks for the question, Dan. So uh, there is a Washington Industrial Safety and Health Act, or WISHA, which is administered by LNI. And so um, if you're an employee and you refuse because of un you deem as unsafe conditions, you're protected from any discrimination under that law. And so there, I can you know add in the, the link, but there's a place where you can file a complaint and you should be protected and should still be getting paid. And so um, the guidelines are pretty, um, pretty uh, seamless on, on the website. It's, you know, making sure that employers are, you know, required to have social distancing, um, conducting frequent cleaning and sanitizing. Um, all of those things mm -hmm. are, are laid out there, but there is a law that protects from any of that discrimination. Thank you. I really appreciate that. That's helpful. Anyone else want to weigh in on that one? We have a, a, lar a, a larger question that came in. Uh, Attorney General Ferguson has offered new guidance that suggests the prohibition on gifting is not so as absolute as many have traditionally treated, especially regarding pandemic recovery. How can the legislature be creative to provide effective, low barrier, and speedy assistance to small businesses to help our economy recover as fast as possible? Uh, and I believe we, we touched on this very lightly when uh, we were talking about projects and programs that would support that recovery, but I thought maybe a little bit more depth there. Who, who would like to take that first? Okay, so um, I, I, mean, <laughs> I, I, mean, I, I know I know you did address think, it on a larger scale. Yeah, I just think that um, in, in my mind, everything we have to look at is out of the box. I mean, what we've always done before is not what we can be doing now. And so, um, and, um, you know, it's, it, I, I think, uh, I don't think we've ever necessarily written caveats or written um, things in legislation that says, you know, in case of pandemic, you know, X, Y, or Z, um, you know, we were, um, and so I just think that there's some, there's places for uh, some broader interpretation, if you will, than perhaps we've had before. I saw that question came in and it did come in this, you know, a little bit, um, I think right before this went on, but I think, you know, we just have to think about things like that and, um, and, and thinking about it in ways we've never thought about it before. So, um, I, I, you know, I think out of the box traditionally. So, um, and having not been through this before, I think there's, you know, I don't think anybody ever has that's sitting at these tables. And so um, I think, but what we do know is we can't do what we have always done. Um, before. That isn't going to work, but we have to get input from people to say, here's what we need and here's what's going to take us to that next step. Um, and, and, and thank you for that. And I think to recap, we, we did talk about it um, earlier when we talked about programs and the resiliency task force that you're looking mm -hmm. at and what some of those uh, programs working with the chamber and other stakeholders could be. Um, I guess the takeaway from that question is that if the attorney general has loosened what we were able to do to private businesses, how do we um, leverage that for our businesses too? Yeah. yeah. But we're at three o'clock and as you can see from our chat, um, our, our members sometimes are very shy, but I want you to know that the uh, questions and the input that you give me, I am sharing on a regular basis uh, with our elected officials, our state uh, delegation, and also um, uh, the city, which is here today with um, council uh, members, uh, um, Coach Mar Honda and the mayor, of course, Jim Farrell. Um, but I want to thank you very much. This was the chamber's first time trying to pull something like this together with a Zoom as we work remotely. So I appreciate everyone's patience and I apologize if I over talked, but I want to, on behalf of the business community, um, offer a thank you for what you are doing and for what you are about to do on behalf of um, businesses here in Federal Way to uh, Senator Claire Wilson, uh, Representatives uh, Jesse Johnson and Mike Pellicciotti. Kudos and hats off and, and thank you from the business community.
And we did it in an hour, everyone. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank, so you, thank, you, thank, thank you, everyone. And we'll be doing more, and of course, we'll share. Uh, this will go online um, next week, and any other follow up I will share with our legislators. So feel free to um, send it along. All right. Thank you very Bye. much. Have a good day.